Oh boy, I am excited about this. I have been waiting a long, long time to get my hands on one of these in any form, and I finally have it. Okay, so for the uninitiated, this is a Mitz Altair 8800. If you've been following this channel for a bit, you probably are aware that I am a pretty big vintage computer collector. And in particular, I have a focus on earlier machines uh, from the early 70s on to the mid 70s. The reason that I've had that focus is I just find the beginnings of the microcomputer industry to be so interesting and all these computers all had their own personalities. So it might surprise you that I didn't have an Altair 8800 already. The Altair 8800, uh, even though it wasn't the first personal computer, it was the first fairly successful one. And it has such a, an important tie-in to the history of microcomputing in terms of, you know, basically giving birth to an industry, the, the home or personal computer industry, as well as having a helping hand in creating huge companies like Microsoft and turning people like Bill Gates into billionaires. Um, this, this is where it all kind of started. It really wasn't that long ago that you could pick up a complete Altair 8800 for $1,500, $2,000, which, you know, is still real money, but it was at least somewhat affordable. Today, I don't know what's going on with the market right now, but Altairs have been just shooting right for the stars. $5,000 seems to be the norm for one of these, and it's just recent. It's literally like in the last year or so. I don't know if it's COVID, COVID cash, people looking for a safer hobby to indulge in while they're sort of semi locked down. I, I don't know. Yeah, so I'm kind of kicking myself for not getting one earlier, uh, but you know, it's all relative, right? When I was starting out collecting 15 years ago, you know, two grand was a lot of money and I was just not willing to spend that on a single item. Um, I'm actually very cheap. It was always just a little bit ahead of my willingness to pay. And in the last few years, as I said, the prices have really exploded. And 5,000 US, that is a lot of money in Canadian. That's about seven grand Canadian. So that's just a little bit more than I'd be willing to pay on a computer that quite honestly, I won't use that often. It'll basically be on display on a shelf for most of the time. Yeah, I just, I couldn't justify it. So I just sort of, you know, lay in wait and just kind of hoped that I would find a deal somewhere. Maybe a seller just decided to flog one with a low buy it now. Not really happening these days, but every now and again it does. Or the other way uh, was to just save up the money and hope that uh, the price didn't keep leaping up beyond uh, what my savings were and I could eventually purchase it that way. Uh, but I have terrible discipline when it comes to saving and I just knew that that was not going to happen. So I started thinking about, you know, could I get one on layaway? <laughs> which you can't really, but I thought, you know, what if I just went for parts and just assembled one from parts? Because pretty much every part and piece of the Altair 8800 has come up on eBay at one time or another. There have been cases, there have been motherboards, there have been individual cards, uh, books, everything. Uh, it's all kind of come up at one time or another on eBay. So I kind of half thought of doing that. I thought, you know, I'm seeing all these parts individually and they're actually not going for that much money. They're going for 50 bucks, 100 bucks. I should just start collecting these and then I'll put it all together as a system one day. And unfortunately, I didn't act on that like I sometimes do. And it was partly because I felt like it was very, very uncertain that I would come across things like the case. I've only ever seen one empty Altair 8800 case come up in probably about 10 years. So I wasn't feeling very confident uh, that that would show up again. And yeah, I'm kind of regretting that now because if I had bought all those parts and pieces, I would have pretty much a complete Altair 8800 with this kit that I purchased. And this machine was found uh, basically in a box at an estate sale by an estate sailor and they basically put it up on eBay with an opening bid and uh, make offer. And I just sort of threw out a low ball offer and they accepted it and it was perfect. Um, you know, we all recognize that it's not a full blown Altair. We're missing a whole lot of stuff. And so, yeah, I got a price that I was happy with. They got a price that they seem to be happy with. And this unbuilt kit found a home. Okay, so let's see what I have. So as I mentioned earlier, what I have here is a partially built partial Altair 8800 kit. And this kit definitely looks to be a Rev Zero machine. 
The Altair went through a series of upgrades and improvements. In addition to the Rev Zero Altair, there's also the Rev One, the 8800A, the 8800B, and what is called the Turnkey. Functionally, the Rev Zero through the 8800B are pretty similar, although the 8800B has a different front panel. The Turnkey was kind of a different thing. It eliminated the front panel switches and LEDs and had an EEPROM installed and basically powered up ready to use a serial terminal. As is typical in collecting, the earlier you go, the more valuable, so the Rev Zero was kind of the king of the hill in that sort of way, just kind of like the Apple II. The stock Rev Zero was fairly basic. It had a 100 pin bus called the Altair bus, later to be known generically as the S100 bus, that a series of cards plugged into for CPU, RAM, and so on. It was powered by the 8-bit Intel 8080 CPU, and the base kit had just 256 bytes of static RAM. To be honest, the Altair 8800 as originally devised really only appealed to hardcore electronics nerds who were just over the moon about having their own quote-unquote computer. The stock Altair had no ROM, so when you powered it up it was basically in a totally disorganized state, and you had to spend time, each time, entering stuff on the front panel to get it to do anything. There was no means of saving anything to tape, even, so if you lost power, tough luck. Later on, MITS and other suppliers gave the machine more RAM, a serial input and output board that allowed for teletype or terminal use, the former usually having a paper tape punch that would serve as your offline program storage. I suppose if I'm being honest, another reason I didn't pick up an Altair early on was just simply that I didn't find the whole setup that interesting. It was only when I saw a YouTuber named DRAMP's video of loading BASIC via teletype that I realized I really wanted one. The early Altair kits were of marginal quality, with MITS cheaping out left and right in an effort to keep the cost down and still make a few bucks. Probably one of the most infamous bits is the cheap wire that they use for connecting things. This original baggie shows the wire as MITS sent it to the kit builders, pre-cut to certain lengths. It's really cheapo stuff. The power supply was a balky and unreliable mess that got really cranky when you started adding things to your system. The kit wasn't a super easy build either. A lot of hobbyists had no idea what they were doing and did things like connect wires the wrong way, break ICEs, and even do crazy stuff like trying to solder using a plumber's torch. Many would-be builders realized they'd gotten in over their heads and at some point in their project simply stopped, which is what I think happened here with my kit. Not that any of these problems were a deterrent to buyers. People greeted news of the Altair as though it was the first contact with aliens. They lined up for blocks and even camped outside MIT's headquarters waiting to get their machine, sometimes for days. You didn't have to build the thing yourself, of course. MITS did offer an assembly service for a fee. In fact, the serial numbers of Altairs are suffixed with either an A or a K to denote assembled versus kit-built units. Given the cost of having the unit professionally assembled, most buyers went for the kits. If you ordered the kit, after a bit of a wait you'd have a ton of components to look through. Baggies of parts, chassis components, transformers, you name it. In terms of what I got with my kit, this is it. I have the upper and lower chassis cover painted in the iconic powder blue and beige. The paint on these pieces is amazing. It's pretty much flawless. I don't see any rust anywhere. It's just got a few little scuffs here and there from being tucked away in a box. There's also an Altair construction manual. And of course, I've got the brains of the machine, the CPU card, as well as the front panel card. Absent? Well, darn near everything else. For example, I don't have an actual Altair backplane or motherboard. I'm also missing the power supply. I'm missing both the front and back cover plates too. Those are all potentially locatable. The really hard thing here is the internal chassis. The chassis is composed of a couple of side rails, the back panel, an inner front panel, and some cross members that the power supply and the Altair plate sit on. Okay, so let's have a look at this stuff here. Well, I've already shown you bag nine with all the brand new wires cut to length for the Altair ready to go. I don't know how many bags of wires there were, Definitely more than this, but at least I've got something here. The next thing we can look at is the CPU board. In my mind, this is the Altair, the most important part of it anyway. This is where the Intel 8080 CPU resides and all the processing happens. For the most part, this board is pretty much built. We do seem to be missing the crystal oscillator and a voltage regulator up here on the left. And of course, we're missing the CPU itself and the 8212 data register and buffer. I'm not 100% sure if these major ICs were supplied with the kit. I note in the manual it doesn't show a price as those probably changed a lot. I'm guessing you would have ordered that though at the time of kit purchase, so yeah, sadly that's missing. We can tell that this board is a Rev Zero quite easily because it says so right here in the bottom corner. But even if we weren't able to see that in photos somewhere like eBay, usually you can tell it's a Rev Zero because the Rev Zero used yellow silk screening to indicate parts placement, whereas the Rev One and later used black. One of the complaints about the Rev Zero was that it was a little bit on the thin side and prone to warpage or breakage. 
I'm not really feeling that here, but yeah, some people complained about it. So the Rev 1 board that followed was made slightly thicker and they fixed a few things to improve timing and reliability. Since we're missing the serial number label that would have come with the kit, we can only guess as to when this kit was purchased. One hint are the date codes on the ICs that are installed. 17th week of 1975 implies a build date no earlier than April of 1975. But that's only a guess. Often manufacturers stocked up parts well in advance of shipping them. Another thing you'll notice about early computer PCBs is that there's no solder mask. They were usually bare like this, and that sometimes caused issues with accidental solder bridges and such. I gotta say, it's really weird to be in the presence of something you've only ever seen in photographs. This is truly an historic piece and it feels surreal to be holding it in my hands. Next up, we have the front panel board. Once again, they were mostly assembled here, but not quite. We've got what looks like all the major ICs installed, but no switches, no LEDs. This board is also clearly a Rev Zero. This board is what gives the Altair its iconic look, although it's typically hidden behind two panels, the inner chassis cover, and then what's called the dress panel, which is painted grey and has all the switch labelings. The dress panel has no screws to hold it in place, it basically gets pressed up against an edge around the perimeter of the chassis cover, and then the back pressure of the inner chassis holds it in there. One of the first things the Altair builder would have looked at upon receiving their kit was the Altair construction guide. One thing I must remark on, this manual is in amazing condition given its age. Typically the manuals for hobbyist computers were little more than photocopies shoved into a ring binder. The paper they used was usually cheap and would yellow badly over 40 years. Pages would get torn and even burnt by stray cigarette ashes. Apparently everybody smoked in the 1970s. But this manual is in exceedingly nice condition with only modest yellowing around the edges of the pages. The paper itself is a fairly thick stock and the binder is just perfect, it has no breaks or cracks. This book is almost a museum piece. One of the first things we encounter in this book is the parts list. This broke down everything you were supposed to receive in your kit, along with anything else you could order. The price list here seems to be effective March 1st, 1975, still fairly early in production. There's also a substitution guide. It was quite common back then for some parts to be unavailable, so kit builders would often substitute their own. To try and head off problems, manufacturers like Mitz sometimes tried to get ahead of this by suggesting substitutions that they knew worked. Another interesting bit in the guide here are the hints. You can tell reading these that Mitz knew many of their customers were novices at electronics, given the little instructional on how to use a soldering iron, something any serious electronics hobbyist ought to have already mastered. Ah, and here's the errata sheet. In a project this complex, there were always little boo-boos like missing parts and incorrect instructions. The very first Altair builders wouldn't have had this information and thus they would have been unwitting guinea pigs and had to learn the mistakes the hard way. The guide then gets into the nitty gritty of construction, and one of the first things we see here are the builder's check marks and notes as they proceeded through this build. I love these, they are sort of an archaeological record that gives us insight into how this kit came to be, how complete it was, and how far along the builder got. We can see that they were working on the front panel here. I think this note in the upper left says begun 1027, so late October. That's another hint as to when this kit was actually purchased and built, and where it fits in overall production. Still, we can't say for sure. When the Altair debuted, the builder probably filled out an order sheet like this one, and then they had a bit of a wait before they actually got their parts in hand. This machine may be closer to April in terms of actual production, but maybe construction didn't start until he received it sometime in the fall. I can't really make out his writing at the bottom right, but you can see his strike throughs as he installed each component. You can see he's fairly organized here, and he's made some notes about the capacitors and placement to prevent confusion. I must note, in terms of the quality of his install work on the actual boards, he seems to have known what he was doing. The soldering job isn't messy. Everything is nice and orderly and undamaged by a stray soldering iron. We can see that he stopped here when it came time to do the wiring. I think his strategy was to build the individual boards to the maximum extent possible, and then start wiring together when he was ready to assemble. This drawing here shows the internal chassis I was talking about. Regrettably, it doesn't contain any measurements. The case was manufactured by a company called Scientific Atlantic and was known as the Optima. A well-regarded hobbyist actually set about trying to produce fully authentic replicas of the Altair, including the case, which he intended to have built by the original company, which still existed. However, the original drawings were apparently lost, so he had to reverse engineer the thing himself. He hasn't been active in the hobby for a while, and the new drawings are owned by him, so asking Scientific Atlantic or its successor to reproduce a new chassis for me unfortunately isn't possible. This page shows the assembly of the front panel and how the switches were installed, and then how the dress panel overlays things. The use of rubber bands to hold things together temporarily is a nice touch. 
Now we get to the CPU board and we can see that definitely the CPU board I have is the one the owner worked on. You can see where he's X'd out all the components he's installed and that he has not X'd out the crystal or voltage regulator which matches perfectly with the board. Okay here's another note with a date. Once again the owner's handwriting is kind of hard to read but it does look like done November 2nd. Is that 1978? Hmm, that would be a bit late to be building this thing. I'm thinking it's more likely that's a five. Anyway, it looks like it took him about a week to get from where he started out on the front panel board. Let's see, here's some more notes and check marks on installed components. And yeah, that's pretty much the end of his notes until we get to the power supply. Note that he's got a new color pen and it says month one at the top. I'm guessing that means it took him a month to get here. Not sure, but what's key for me in this is that we can see that there were more parts to this kit, now since lost, since he was working on the power supply here, which I don't have. Lots of duns on these pages as he went through it. He even got to the point of installing the fuse, it looks like. These notes here describe the installation of the transformer, back in red pen again. I'm not sure if he's just changing pens or sort of went back and forth in the manual according to what made sense to him. However, it does once again confirm that there were more parts with this kit, that it was likely a complete kit at one point. Sadly, we don't know what became of the chassis. Maybe it was stored in a different box and got thrown out, not looking like anything but random bits of metal and electronics gear. It kind of haunts me to think that it may be sitting in a box up in an attic or down in a basement somewhere awaiting future discovery. This diagram shows more detail about how the internal chassis goes together. It's not a very complex arrangement and I think it would be fairly straightforward to reproduce if I chose to do that. Once we get past the power supply here, there are no further notes from the owner indicating that the power supply may have been the final thing he worked on. That of course makes me wonder, why? Why did he stop? Did he lose confidence? Did he lose interest? Did something happen to him? Unfortunately, we may never know. The estate this gear came from may have been that of the original owner, but it may also have just been a general collector. This is a story whose end we may only be able to wonder about. The rest of the manual covers the rest of construction, and then there are some checkout procedures and programming examples. I cannot wait to try these one day, although for now I can only imagine the thrill of having a working Altair to use. Well, that's it for the manual, and basically that's all there is to our kit for now. The seller of this kit promised to alert me if anything else showed up, but uh, it's pretty unlikely. The missing bits to the untrained eye may not look like anything important, just random junk, so if they don't know what it is, they might just throw it out. Still, I'm pretty happy with what I've got, particularly that I didn't have to pay $5,000 to get it. There's just enough here to let me say that I have an Altair. I can put it up on a shelf next to its incomplete baby brother, this Altair 680. Now to the next question, what do I do with it? Okay, so what to do with a partially built, partial Altair kit? Um, that's a tough one. Um, I think I'm leaning towards building it. Um, I know there are some people out there that are collectors that feel like, you know, you don't want to do something like that with something like this because this is all original. And the tendency would be if you were going to build something like this, you would want to make it 100% original. Otherwise, it's kind of a, you know, bastardized half and half type deal. And it is extremely difficult to find original Altair 8800 parts. Um, you know, there weren't that many made to begin with. And through attrition, there's just not a whole lot left. Yeah, so I mean, there is some temptation to sort of just leave it as is, you know, put it on display somewhere. Here's another example of a former kit builder who didn't quite finish the kit, which is probably the fate of a lot of Altairs. But, um, I, I kind of feel like, you know, it, it's a computer, it was meant to do something, and leaving it like this doesn't really add any value. If this were a complete kit, uh, you know, I might be a little more reluctant. If the boards were completely unassembled, yeah, I might have a little more trouble with that. You know, there's something about being the first guy to put a soldering iron to a vintage board. Yeah. I have some vintage Mark 8 boards in my collection that I have not touched. They're fully original. They've never had a soldering iron put to them. There's definitely a lot of reluctance there to, to mess with those. And in that case, I'm particularly disinclined to build it because uh, there are just so few examples of unbuilt vintage computer kits, period. The Mark 8 was an extremely rare computer, so the number of unbuilt kits for that, I, I can count on one hand. I think there's like two or three in existence total. I think one of them's in a museum somewhere. So in that situation, I wouldn't build it. But in this situation, I kind of feel like we're not really gaining anything by just leaving it as it is. And I actually picked up an original four kilobyte dynamic memory board um, because I was anticipating that if I do build this Altair 8800, I'm probably not gonna do it to the bare stock 
uh, original specs because, you know, one kilobyte of memory is, <laughs> you can't really do much with that and it loses its appeal really quickly. And like I said, I saw that uh, video that DRAM put out uh, basically where he was running it with a teletype. That's kind of the zone I want to be in. I want to be able to hook it up to my teletype model 33 and I want to, you know, load up the first versions of uh, Altair Basic. Now in terms of how I would go about doing that, uh, one way would obviously be to just sort of hunker down for the next five or ten years or however long it takes and just keep scooping up original parts as they come available. They do come available from time to time. It's not common, uh, but it does happen. Uh, another option would be to build it kind of like a hybrid type thing. So I would build the original computer to the extent possible with new old stock parts and then whatever I couldn't find, I would basically just sub in new parts and basically live with that. And I've actually gone part way uh, towards doing that. This is uh, a reproduction motherboard or backplane for an Altair 8800. Uh, it's produced by a fellow or a company uh, out of the UK on eBay. And uh, I mean, it doesn't look original, obviously. It's got the modern uh, solder mask on it. But apart from that, um, you know, it would function just fine. It's going to be inside the machine. It's not like people are really going to notice. Uh, I also got these 3D printed uh, card guides for it. So there's, there's that option. Um, so yeah, I could do that, you know, I could kind of build it museum style where, you know, maybe I do something fancy with the front here and I just have like uh, smoked plexiglass or something like that and, you know, you can see the inner workings of the computer. You know, if I have a motherboard and I have the cards and I wire it all together, I have enough there to basically run an altar. I know I can find switches, I know I can find LEDs, I can find vintage uh, chips to put in there uh, and then away we go. It's more about the, the visual stuff and you know, how do you accommodate not having the internal chassis to go in the cover here. But there are options. I actually have a client uh, who's got a little metal fab shop and he actually used to build PC cases. So he said if I can get my hands on an original piece, I could actually take measurements and he'll actually make the original parts again. That's a little tricky because Altairs are not common and they're especially not common up here in Canada. I'd have to find somebody willing to lend me one that I could measure somehow. Probably not likely. The other thing is just to hope that somebody else takes on the project. There have been quite a few Altair kit type things uh, that have come out recently. There's the Altair Arduino. Uh, there's another one they did, it was really small. I forget the name of it. And there have been others. So it's possible something else will come out later and I'll be able to do that. Another possibility is I could just sort of build things um, temporarily a certain way so that I can start using the thing and be able to use it in the interim and then just gradually replace with original parts as and if they become available. One thing I'm thinking about not seeking out an original of is the original power supply. I've heard nothing but bad stories about the original Rev Zero Altair power supply. I'm thinking I maybe might just go with uh, a couple of switching power supplies to give me the voltages I need. You know, it, if it's hidden in the case, it's not really going to matter and it's going to deliver cleaner and better power, which is going to be better for preserving the vintage components on the boards. Uh, and it's more forgiving, you know, if you make mistakes, uh, it's not going to just go on fire, which is always nice. So yeah, that's, uh, you know, kind of where things sit for now. Uh, I am already embarking on looking for parts. I'm talking to different folks about options to reproduce the case. So, you know, it's all kind of in motion. And uh, when I do get to a stage where I'm actually starting to put the thing together, I will definitely document that and put it out there. But uh, yeah, that's kind of it for this video. If you have any comments on all this, any thoughts, any sources of parts, by all means, drop a comment in the comment section. Be glad to hear from you. And apart from that, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you another day.